I can honestly say, hand on heart, I have never had a reaction to anything that I have done ever, not even Big Brother, I don't think, where I have literally been stopped in the street nonstop. I've been stopped by people at the supermarket, by men, women who were talking about the documentary that I filmed for Channel 4 about perimenopause and menopause. And it has made me realise that we just, we, I, we've just got to talk about it nonstop, like literally nonstop, because for as many people have heard it, there's still so many people that aren't getting the message. So we showed a bit of um, the podcast that I recorded with Dr. Louise New Newson, who is a menopause specialist, and she runs a private practice, but she also has launched a free app called Balance for menopausal women. And she gives lots and lots of free resources to uh, anybody that wants to read them. She does these amazing podcasts, which obviously are free. She has started, because she's not the busiest woman in the world already, the Menopause Charity. And I am an ambassador for that, which aims to kind of provide free resources for healthcare professionals and also to de-demonise and demystify HRT. So I put a little bit of it on my YouTube channel and um, I thought, well, well, I will put a bit on there and see, you know, see how it goes. Anyway, we've had an enormous response from it and a lot of really good comments. I have lost my laptop and I wanted to answer some of the comments, but actually I think I'm going to put the full version on this week and then I will answer comments next week. So I'll answer lots of questions. If you want to ask me anything, please feel free to do so. And, you know, share it with your friends, tell everybody about it, because this is stuff we all need to know. And I've never felt such fantastic solidarity with womankind. And uh, it's, it's really good. So when I met some of the doctors when I first started my clinic, they said, Louise, why are you doing it privately? We do this all the time in our general practices. And I said, yeah, I have done for the last 20 years as well. But come to my clinic and sit in and you'll, you'll listen to stories of women who are denied HRT, the evidence-based treatment for the perimenopause and menopause, that we go by nice guidance. And they sort of looked at me, came and sat in, and a lot of them have actually cried at the end of the day because the stories that we hear and... That's why I thought I've got to do more. I've got to spread the word and do more. And I think it's the same, obviously, with you. The more stories you hear, you know it's not just me saying them because it's in my clinic. These are women. And it's not just a UK problem. It's a global problem, isn't it? Well, definitely. And, I mean, I, um, I, I, it's interesting that you said that you cried and some of them cried because I, um, I just did a podcast, you know, Postcast from Midlife with Lorraine. Yes. Yeah. and um, they, they sent me a few kind of snippets from it and one of them is just of me sobbing because she's told me a story about a woman that's posted on her channel and it's, it's the stories of women that um, are so desperate that they feel that they can't go on with their lives. That's what I just find so heartbreaking when there's such an easy fix that costs mm -hmm. the NHS next to nothing. I think it's something like £120 for a year's worth of um, HRT because often people say, oh, well, is it expensive? Is that why? It's not. No. And it's absolutely not. And I, I had no idea. And, you know, I've done a lot of psychiatry training as part of an undergraduate hospital medicine. We often saw people who were, you know, suicidal, contemplating ending their lives. And never once did I think about their hormones because no one had taught me. And mm. um, just last week, Rebecca Lewis and I had a meeting with professors at the Maudsley Hospital, so the, the big psychiatric hospital. And um, they were very engaged. We're going to start to do some research. But they all admit they don't know how to prescribe HRT. And they said, well, But I've asked you this before, Louise, because we've talked about um, prescribing HRT. And I often listen to women when they say they've been to their GPs. And to me, it sounds like the GPs are frightened because they don't know what to say. They don't know which HRT to offer, which is safe, which isn't safe. And there are two very clear distinctions between safe and unsafe HRT. But if there are any yeah, GPs... Yeah, I mean, there isn't actually any unsafe HRT. There's safer, but it's all pretty safe. And actually, if you compare it to the contraceptive pill, 
it's still not safer than the contraceptive pill, that we don't act like smarties because it is safe. So any risks are incredibly small. But the problem is all this misinformation has been fueled and fueled over the last 20 years. And I don't know if any of you have listened to the podcast that we released yesterday with Prof Professor Rob Langer, who was one of the investigators for the WHI study. And he talks about how they stopped the study early and they 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 tried to get a result to stop the study because it was a billion dollar study. They weren't getting any results. So they decided to leak out the breast cancer risk that actually wasn't statistically significant, wasn't there. And he tried to stop the publication, but it already gone to press. And he said, if you do this, it's going to damage women's health irreversibly. And I mean, it's already gone out to the medical press and the media. And it's really sad, actually, talking to him because you think, goodness me, it has been irreversible. But then you only have to go another look other websites. I was just before we um, started this, I was going on to the NHS website to look at menopause and HRT just in case it had been updated. Or Miraculously. Was <laughs> after the programme, lots of people will be going to it. And it's telling me here about the risks. And it, and it talks about HRT and it says types, fine. It says side effects. Well, most women don't get side effects if they're on the right dose and type it's telling me about the risks and it's telling me about alternatives it does mention there's a benefit in osteoporosis but it doesn't say there's a benefit for reducing risk of diabetes heart disease dementia why not i don't know Davina, because i think people are slow to catch up but actually i think it's inexcusable when you have wrong information we have really clear guidelines we have really good evidence and we need to be working out of that and it's always very difficult in medicine when things change, but nothing's really significantly different over the last 20 years. Even if you look at the WHI study, which obviously is this one that everyone thought risks, risks, the risks were very small. And even there, the risks of the sort of bad type HRT are still, the risk of breast cancer with that is less than the risk a woman has if she drinks a couple of glasses of wine a night, if she's overweight or if she doesn't exercise. So actually, What is the bad HRT when we're talking about yeah. that? What do, they, what do they say is? So the bad type is a tablet estrogen because it has a small risk of clot. It's only very small. Um, and also the older types of progestogens. And now they have this maybe very small risk of breast cancer, but they also have a small risk of clots and a small risk of heart disease and lots of women find they get side effects with them as well like a bit bloating a bit irritable maybe a bit spotty and so, so when oh so that's the old yeah. type of progesterone because i often hear about women that are having issues with progesterone and spotting and bloating yeah, and... yeah. So, so maybe that's... they're on the wrong well the yes. other thing that so the newer ones are body identical which means that they are they are producing the same as what the same yeah, hormones. If, we, if you look down the microscope, you'll see it's exactly the same structure, the same formulation as the estrogen, progesterone, testosterone we produce ourselves. And they're all derived from the yam plants, so not from pregnant. But they're plant based. It's so not from horse based. urine. Yeah, the yeah. modern HRT is plant based. Yeah. It's not yeah. from horse urine. It is body identical, not bioidentical, because bioidentical is unregulated. Yeah, so we still sometimes people, it's, it can be confusing because some people say regulated bioidentical, which is the same as body identical. But if it's compounded bioidentical, so basically if it's expensive, don't do it. If the clinic's asking you to do a saliva test or blood tests and, and it just feels uncomfortable, it's often a compounded bioidentical. So all the products are available on the NHS, or they should be. The East estrogen and the progesterone the testosterone as you know isn't licensed for women which is in my mind absolutely outrageous that we're not allowed our own hormone back louise tell them about testosterone in terms of testosterone estrogen production this absolutely blew me away when you told me this so women produce about four times more testosterone than estrogen before the menopause see it's our hormone <laughs> So, and it is, and you, but you know what, Davina, I didn't even know that until about six years ago. I sat in a clinic, I decided I wanted to do more menopause work, and I've always given, actually, the old style HRT for the last 20 years to people, because that's all I knew, really. Um, and most of them still felt better, and they, they ha were healthier, so that was fine. And then the new type came out and was more, more prescribed. And I sat in a clinic in London and this, this very learned professor was giving people testosterone. I was like, what? What's that? What's that? And he said, no, it's incredible. 
So then I read more. And then you realize, actually, it's, this is just our normal hormone. We're not giving people drugs. We're not, you know, and it's a lot of the studies have been done in libido, about libido. And of course, libido is very important, but it's actually testosterone is very important in our brains. So it can be really good for mood, energy, concentration, Focus, stamina. Yeah. Sleep is really good. I mean, I am very open that I use testosterone and I wish I'd started it about 10 years ago. I was probably perimenopausal for many years without realising. And, you know, it's it's very difficult because you can't always diagnose. We often do do a blood test to look and see how low it is. But anyone who's perimenopausal or menopausal will have low levels. You have to have oestrogen on board first, otherwise it just converts to testosterone. Um, but there's a lot more women who would benefit from it. It used to be licensed. They used to have a patch. And then the company um, folded and they, the MHRA decided to stop the license. Oh. Uh, I don't quite know why, because... Can, can you I ask you something? Yeah. This, it, it, I get very angry. I mean, I'm starting to get angry now. I can feel it already. Yeah. I don't understand. Say, for example, GPs, you would learn a, a, a quite a good level of how to deal with a pregnant woman. Oh, yeah. Am I correct? You would know what to do. You'd know what was happening, how to look after a pregnant woman. But not all women will have babies. I oh, know. We learn a lot. Can you imagine coming to see me? Okay, I'm a, I'm a GP and you come and see me and you've been diagnosed with raised blood pressure. And I say, oh, Davina, I'm really sorry. I don't know any medicines to treat blood pressure. You could go on a diet. You could do some exercise. Uh, but actually, don't worry about it. It will increase your risk of a heart attack. But it doesn't matter. Come back if it's really bad. And I might get you to see one of my doctors. Or I'll refer you to a clinic. But we haven't got many blood pressure clinics in the NHS. So, um, you know, and, and then take out the word blood pressure. Put in the word menopause. Oh, sorry, Davina. Your menopausal, it increases your risk of a heart attack. But not just a heart attack, actually actually it increases your risk of diabetes osteoporosis dementia and bowel cancer and early death but i don't know anything about it you know? so i don't know how to prescribe anything for you so go away and come back if it gets really bad and and or i'll give you an antidepressant and it's it, but it, there's a big move out there i don't want to be rude about doctors because no. a lot of doctors and also nurses and pharmacists who i who I educate and, and lecture really, really want to know more. And a lot of doctors have said to me, it was only hearing your lecture made me realise the bigger picture about the menopause because we talk pretty much the same as other women, that it's hot flushes, it's sweats. Women, even in the NHS website, it said your symptoms will improve after 12 years. Now, I've seen women with symptoms for 30 years. Yeah. So, so you sort of think, oh, it's a bit of a failure going to see my doctor. And then if we've only been taught it's hot flushes, sweats, then, you know, so it's not the doctor's fault. It's just the way it's happened. And I think the media haven't helped. You know, what you're doing, um, and you know, with the programme and just being vocal is amazing. You know, five years ago, I don't think any celebrity even admitted she was on HRT. Well, I, you know what? I really thought long and hard before I did. I know you did. Yeah. I really did. Because I thought, I thought... That's... I thought I... I thought what's, I'd be judged. What's this month's been like, though, to be It's been... Because... Don't, because I'm going to get emotional. It's what been really... It? It's been really amazing. Mm. It really has. And, and it's been an... It's been an outpouring because I think people just feel like they can talk about it and it's not something we all have to brush underneath the carpet. No, I know. But it, it's so important because, you know, I couldn't get HRT from my own doctor and I would have given up work as a GP if I wasn't on HRT. Yeah. I could see my life just falling apart and I wasn't severe like the people I see mm. and you know every day we we hear these stories and, and we hear them on social media as well and you know I think things are changing we, I want to leave this Instagram live with a bit of positivity because it is really hard for women and I think what's <laughs> happening out there is that women are empowering themselves and even when they're knocked down with the menopause they can still get information and you know, go with a friend, talk to a doctor, push back, I think is really important. And um, and it's amazing that you're one of the ambassadors for the menopause charity, which we're going to launch next week, officially with our website. The day after the show, right? Yes. Yeah. Which so is great. we're going to really help women and also help healthcare professionals as well. And we've got a army of people who are already helping, but we're going to have a lot more. And obviously there's Liz Earl, who's our Oh, listen, I quickly yeah. want to give shout outs to people that we think 
that this army of women, I mean, I've never, I've never done an Instagram live with this many people watching. There's 3,167 of you, which again makes me very emotional because I just feel like it's something that women need to hear. But there are lots of warriors out there that people should follow. And Liz Earl is one of them. She is an amazing advocate for all things menopause. She's such a great person to talk to. She's got so many great resources on her website, on her Instagram. Yeah, and she's like, but she's like you. So there's obviously you, her and Lorraine Kelly. And all three of you, I'm very fortunate because I know very well, but all three of you have not just taken what I've said and gone, oh, that's interesting, Louise, I'm going to regurgitate. You've taken a step back and you've said, is that really true? Are you sure? And you've gone and done your own research. And I think that is incredible because you're not just regurgitating you but it, it it's really quite shocking and I think the program on Channel 4 next week you know I, I have watched a bit of it and I cried even though I hear these stories every day and um, Kate Muir has done the most amazing job at getting a lot of information but not losing sensitivity as well and that's quite hard when you've mm. got lots of facts to get over isn't mm. it and, for sure. I mean, there are, there's a couple of questions that I got asked today, which I didn't know the answer to. And I like to feel like I know the answer to quite a lot, apart from the really medical ones. And then I often you'll have a resource on your News and Health website. The resources on your News and Health site are free. Doctor. Menopause Doctor. Menopause Doctor, yeah. menopause doctor website. The, the resources on the Menopause Doctor website are free. So they are, you, yeah, anybody can go and access them. You don't have to pay to get access to them. But I was asked by a friend of mine today who said um, she's, you know, in her early 60s, but she still feels terrible. Is there, is there any way she's allowed to start later? I said I thought yes. Yeah, of course. There's nothing. What, what really annoys me in medicine is that there's no black and white. There's no you are forbidden, you are allowed. It's about what is right for that individual. And certainly the NICE, the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence guidelines we work out of for menopause say that women need to have an individualised consultation. So for example, anything we do really in medicine should be individualised. I'm not going to tell you to exercise more because you exercise a lot already for example but other people who aren't even getting off the couch of course I'll, I'll encourage them to exercise more so we look at the bigger picture with HRT what's happened because everyone's so scared of it is that when this study the WHI study came out it said the benefits are really there mostly in women who start HRT within 10 years of their menopause so that means on average, not that any woman's average, that you start it and you get the most benefits under the age of 60. So a lot of people have in this mind, oh my goodness, something awful happens over 60. In this study, I've already said they use the older types of HRT, but they also gave it to people who had heart disease, who were overweight, obese. So you can imagine if you have if hopefully our blood vessels, hopefully we're healthy, nice and clean, they're open, they've got no disease in front, in, inside them. If you had had a heart attack and were obese, your blood vessels would start to narrow. They get these fatty deposits. They get um, sort of a bit of clotting sort of stuff in it. So the blood's a bit sludgy. I've already said if you have oestrogen, it increases your risk of a, a clot. If you have tablet oestrogen, then there is a small risk of a heart attack. And this is what happened in the WHI study, because I've already said they gave that tablet oestrogen. So then people were saying, oh, you have to be really careful women over the age of 60. But actually, most women we start HRT on in their 60s, 70s, 80s or 90s are not obese, are not people who've had big heart attacks. And we wouldn't give them orally oestrogen anyway. So if you give it through the skin, it actually works to relax the blood vessels in the same way that some of the blood pressure treatments we use relaxes blood pressures, lowers blood pressure. So it actually... And there's no well. risk of clot from transdermal. No risk, of clot, no risk of clot. No, because it goes straight through the skin into the bloodstream bypasses our liver which produces our clotting factors um, and so it just works straight away so it's just replacing that hormone so in fact our oldest patient was uh, for her 90th birthday treated herself to a consultation and got on HRT so it's never too old to start HRT. Uh, and that is amazing to hear because I do get asked that a lot. Well there's a lot of women so the WHI study this awful study that was the nail in the coffin for HRT came out in 2002 so 19 years ago so over the last 19 years there's women who have suffered and suffered and suffered and suffered and now they're thinking 
am I too late? And no one is too late and no one's too late for advice. So it's really important. We have got a leaflet on the website, which is specifically for starting HRT many years after the menopause. And the other thing to add is this magic 60 doesn't mean that when we all reach 60, we have to stop taking HRT. No. Take it forever. Some, someone said something really funny on Twitter the other night. She said, because somebody asked me the question about, well, my doctor wants me to come off it. And I was like, absolutely not. And um, the, this other woman tweeted, she said, I'm going to have it pumped into my coffin. <laughs> <laughs> really made me laugh. Um, so the other thing is, I think that um, I get a lot of women talking about being forced into um, the menopause, like out of nowhere from a hysterectomy. Yes. And not getting any support at all because of it, especially young women or somebody going, I've been put on the minimum amount. And this is another one that really upsets me. Yeah. So... When we talk about surgical menopause, if your ovaries, both of them are removed, you are therefore going to be menopausal the next day because you haven't got any hormones. If you have one ovary removed, you're more likely to become menopausal because that little one ovary might not work as well. If you have a, your womb removed and you still have your ovaries, there's a risk that you might go into menopause earlier because your ovaries and the blood supply to your womb and the ovaries is similar and it might be disrupted in the operation and it's almost like the two have to work together so and that's really difficult for women who've had a hysterectomy and they have their ovaries because they haven't got any periods to know what's going on mm. um the nice guidance are very clear that if a woman's going to have her ovaries removed then she should discuss with the surgeon before the ser before the operation mm. not the morning of the operation when she's wheeled in and having that mm. In advance about whether to take HRT and as you know Davina there's very few women who cannot take HRT. Who would not be able to take HRT? No one I don't think really. Really? The, the, the big worry is if a woman's had an oestrogen receptor positive cancer so that's yes. not breast cancer but some other types of cancers can have oestrogen receptors in them. Now, a lot of people think, well, that means oestrogen has caused the breast cancer or fueled it or initiated it. And it's more cancer is a lot more complicated than that. If it was all about oestrogen causing breast cancer, then loads of young women and pregnant women would get breast cancer. Mm. Women who were older, who had gone through the menopause with low oestrogen would we wouldn't get it. Yeah. So it's just even if you look simplistically. So there's a lot more that happens um, for breast cancer. But we know that... Um, some studies have shown that if you block oestrogen, the, then the prognosis might be better for women. But the biggest benefit for women who have breast cancer is, is surgery and also radiotherapy as, as well. So blocking oestrogen might help some women, but the majority of women would do really well anyway. And so it's looking at why we're blocking the um, oestrogen and refusing oestrogen as well, actually, because a lot of women come to us in the clinic and they say, do you know, I've got such bad vaginal dryness, I can't sit down. Yeah. Sex and my bones hurt so much. I can't. I can't sleep. I can't function. I can't. I can't. It just can't work as a woman. And um. And I'm also worried about my risk of osteoporosis and mm. heart disease and everything else. So, so for those women, they actually might still choose to take HRT. Some but that's their choice. Know, absolutely. And some of, the women, some of the studies have shown that women who've had breast cancer who take HRT actually have a better prognosis. And what's very interesting is that oestrogen used to be a treatment for breast cancer before tamoxifen. So... Yeah, because oestrogen is very good for our bodies. So it can induce this thing called apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. So it sort of kills cells. So it's thought that it kills cancer cells as well. And women who take HRT are less likely to get bowel cancer, less likely to get other cancers, and they're also less likely to die from breast cancer. So if you look at breast cancer, is it the diagnosis that's worrying you, or is it dying oh from breast God. cancer that's worrying, from, you know, worrying you? One yeah. in seven of us taking HRT will get breast cancer because yes. one in seven women get breast cancer. Mm. But actually, we know from all the studies, actually, that women taking any type of HRT, even the bad type, have a lower risk of death from breast cancer. So, you know, this is where it's really important. Yeah. We also know that most women, thankfully, who've had breast cancer survive. 
and they've got a whole life ahead of them. Except but, got but heart disease and a massive heart attack. Yeah. Maybe not, but, right? So, no, and so we've just written a booklet and it was probably the hardest thing that I helped write because it was a booklet for women who've had breast cancer. In fact, I've got one here. This is what it looks like. So it's, it says, been through breast cancer tick, did someone mention menopause? And it's a guide to all things menopause for women after breast cancer. And we've, it's quite long, um, but we've written it. And actually, I, two of the doctors who worked with me, one of them's actually had breast cancer, were involved. And we got a patient involved who'd had breast cancer as well. Um, and we've done it, I hope very sensitively any feedback is most welcome because we can always change and improve it but it it is about choice you know i'm not going to tell you which car to drive and some mm. cars are going to be more dangerous than others mm. that's your choice davina mm. or you know when to cross the road everything we do is a bit of a risk but we look at the overall benefits and and what's happened with so many women whether they've had breast cancer or, or not they're just they've just been sort of pushed into this it's too risky you can't have it and a bit mm. like on the nhs website it's telling me all the risks but actually it's not telling me that with hrt you can continue your job with hrt your partner won't leave you with yeah HRT, you can still have sex with hrt you're less likely to have osteoporosis heart disease dementia and this is where we have to change the narrative and let women make a decision it's our bodies it's our future we need to be able to decide really don't we and um we you were talking about sex and sex life and i mean we we talked to a woman on the documentary about um the pain that she went through because she had a vaginal atrophy and her vagina was so dry that she was literally trying to sit on ice blocks she couldn't sit down she was in absolute agony she couldn't exercise she couldn't do anything and vaginal estrogen there are so many women that suffer with it and um and yet yeah. vaginal estrogen is is almost sort of unknown or unheard of and well, it carries zero yeah. risk of anything no so so even on actually i was looking again on the nhs website it's telling me that vaginal estrogen is a is a type of hrt well it's not because it's not replacing hormones in the body all it's doing is using estrogen locally in the vagina and spreading to the surrounding tissues so this means that women who are really a bit scared of estrogen if they've had an estrogen receptor positive cancer and it might be a bit too soon to consider hrt or they don't want to they can still use vaginal estrogen and we've just written a consensus document with the british society of sexual medicine who i do some work with just going through and looking at all the evidence about it because it is so safe and as you know some women who take hrt probably about 20 percent still need to use vaginal estrogen and um i know you were saying on the documentary even just wiping yourself after having a wee it didn't quite feel the same and and you know some people say just literally walking it's very uncomfortable and um, painful. It shouldn't be. If there's any change to the vagina, but also any urinary symptoms, the first thing as women we should be thinking about, are we on vaginal estrogen? And a lot of women I see in my clinic have been referred to urologists, to gynecologists. I mean, this is crazy, and isn't it? And you just say, well, let's have some anyway. And it often really melts away because the estrogen also goes into the blood and surrounding tissues. So some urinary symptoms, some people just find coughing and sneezing, they have a bit of a leak. Well, that's not normal. So having some vaginal estrogen can help with that, can help reduce urinary tract infections. And What's vaginitis? Because somebody asked me about that today. She yeah, said so itis just means inflammation. So it means inflammation of the vagina. And so some people can get something called vaginitis or, or vaginismus as well, where you get sort of abnormal um, sort of tightening really of the vagina and as you can imagine it's a very sensitive area <laughs> um, and if someone's had a bad sexual experience every time they have sex it's going to be awful but it's not just sex actually it can be smears as well so you know the cervical screening um i did a survey on my instagram about a year ago and about 60 60 percent of women had had not gone for their next smear test because the last one was so painful Oh no, that's terrible. Which is awful, and we hear it a lot, but then when it is painful, the nurse will just say, oh well, never mind, it's only every three years or every five years, don't worry about it. Well no, actually, if it's uncomfortable, it's likely there's some early vaginal dryness happening and they need to have vaginal estrogen. But I think... Yeah, go on, sorry. I, I just wanted to say, what I love about you, Louise, is that 
all of these things that you say when people say, well, it's okay, it's just another three years, or doctors or nurses that don't know enough about it, and I know that there are lots out there who do, but doctors that don't will go, just, you know, it's natural, it's normal, it's the way things happen. And what I love about you is every time I say anything to you, you're like, no, well, no, <laughs> we're not going to take it. And I said in um, that, that little film that I put on my Instagram yes. today, and you, you put on yours, we, I cut it for you, um, I, I said in that that this I take testosterone and I, I still feel judged by people for taking testosterone, but I'm not taking it to feel different. I'm taking it to get me back to normal. And do I deserve to feel back to normal? Yes, well, I do. I mean, I think the other great thing, I mean, that film is brilliant for so many reasons. So thank you for doing it. It's a great it. pleasure. But also at the beginning, you're taking thyroxin. Now, thyroxine is another hormone, right? You could live without it, but without it, you'd feel really tired, sluggish. You'd Exhausted. Mm. But you could, you could survive. But which, who, would just, who would stop you from having thyroxine? I don't think anyone would, and it's very mm. easy to prescribe. And so certainly when I lecture doctors and, 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 and healthcare professionals and all the doctors that work with me are the same, they give a lot of lectures too. We try and break it down and say, look, it's actually really easy to prescribe HRT and on my website, if any of you go to the Menopause Doctor website and, and put in easy, there's an easy HRT prescribing guide. A lot of women have downloaded it and printed it off and given it to their doctors because it, it just says... Oh, where do they find it again? On so on the Menopause Doctor website, Yeah. if you just search easy, it yeah. will come up as easy HRT prescribing guide and it's just a PDF. You can just print it so off. So you can print it off and take it to your doctor yeah, if, that, if you feel they're a bit nervous about what yeah, to do. Yeah, it's referenced as well because obviously I get a lot of pushback from some healthcare professionals because I run a private clinic yeah just about my private clinic and you know what Tavina I would love to tell you that the women who come to my clinic are women that are very complicated medically or that they've got lots of money but they're not and you know we have women who um that their family give 20 quid each to pay or it's a birthday present and recently actually we had a lady who came and um she came downstairs to pay and my receptionist said, no, it's paid for already, your boss has paid for it. And he had um, seen the change in her and he didn't want to lose her as an employee oh. because she's a really valuable member of her team. So he phoned in advance to so our practice manager and says, I want to pay for her when she comes, but I want it as a surprise. So oh. he paid for it. And honestly, she burst into tears, we all burst into tears. But isn't that amazing? Because actually for him, that is the best amount of money he will spend because she was 45. But Louise, you know, I, I'm going to go to better light. Louise, this is a thing, another thing that I feel really strongly about. And I do love businesses for doing it. But often businesses are saying, we're going to start a thing where people can take days off because of the menopause. Yeah. Oh. But actually, I would rather get, and this is something I'd love to talk to the charity about, I would l rather send out envoys of people to tell big companies that they should start a mini menopause clinic within Absolutely. their and business. You know what, I mean, that's what we, we started to do that. And we're certainly um, looking at doing it more with the, with the menopause as well, because there's one thing, awareness is really important. We did a survey with West Midlands Police, where I, as you know, worked for a while, and we found that 78% of women didn't know what was going on until they had information about the menopause and a lot of them had been signed off for depression anxiety yeah. migraines all these things but actually what they don't really want is a time of flexible working because that's less no. that's like what they're going to do with their time so yeah you know at, certainly at my work i we employ a lot of people and we have a policy that they get free consultations obviously but, you know, I invest time in them because actually if they're on the right dose and type of HRT, I'll get, you know, a lot better out of them. I don't want them making mistakes. And also they're going to love coming to work. And it's great. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, but what we're trying to do, and certainly with the charity we want to do a lot more, is really educating the workplace, but trying to help so that women can get in-house um, appointments. Because, you know, if you're at work, half an hour your life will be transformed by having the right consultation but we also need to make it covered by medical insurance because it's not covered by insurance it's you know, terrible if I was a man with low testosterone or i'd had my testicles removed i would have 
testosterone on, on private insurance, but it's not for women. So if I, my youngest patient, as you know, is 19. I have another young patient who's 23 who is unable to get her HRT from the NHS. They've refused to give it to her. What? So had to, I know, they, the first, oh, it's just so sad. So she's in a same-sex relationship. The first doctor she saw was an endocrinologist, a, a hormone specialist, and said, HLT is too risky for you. She's, she's just become menopausal early, which some women do, no reason. Her periods had stopped and she started to get symptoms. And because she, she's in a same-sex relationship, she said, well, what about being able to um, have a baby? And he said, it doesn't matter because there's two wombs in your relationship. So she went away very sad and then she came to the clinic and Dr. Sarah Ball, who's probably busy typing away, had um, um, saw her and transformed her life. She was suicidal when she came to the clinic. Really, really awful. She's really improved with the right dose and type of HRT, but she wants to buy a house with her partner and she shouldn't and can't afford to come to the clinic. And so um, where she is in Greater Manchester, they won't prescribe the HRT, they won't prescribe the body identical hormones. So she went to a gynecologist who said, you're wasting my time. The dose of hormone you're on is too high. You need to go on a really low dose patch and that's all you can have. Um, but surely she needs it even more than we do. Of course she does, because when you're young, you have to replace the missing hormones. And when you're in your 20s, your body needs a lot more hormones. And if it doesn't have enough, you've got this increased risk of all these diseases and also feeling suicidal. So um, she's been really struggling. And I've been engaging with people high up in the NHS to say, why can't she get it? And people are looking into it. But the meanwhile, she's run out of her HRT. So what does she do? Does she become suicidal give up her job or get it from us privately and of course we don't charge much money for the any for the hrt because morally i don't want to make money out of that but it, it's not right she shouldn't be paying anything she should be getting it free and if you're well you're you've got hypothyroidism so therefore you get free prescriptions on the nhs for everything yeah, don't you? yeah. so yeah. what i want to do with the charity is campaign that yeah We'd all get everything free if we were on a hormone replacement. Because and like I said earlier, it's not like it's really expensive. No. And if you think about um, osteoporosis and uh, doing a hip replacement, a hip replacement's 15 grand. And HRT, which could prevent osteoporosis, is at 120 quid a year. Like, go figure. And think about the effect on the economy that getting all these women who would like access to HRT, if you got them all on HRT, you would have them feeling better than they have done in years and back at work and really enjoying it. And we are a formidable workforce. When you think about women in, women in the workplace, we're amazing. We, <laughs> don't we? It's, it's, but it's totally true. And, you know, I, I um, one of my patients actually who, um, I've been talking to the NHS about as an example. So she had a really good high powered job and um, she just couldn't work because her brain didn't function and she was feeling very overwhelmed. So she decided to work as a local vet as a, in a receptionist, nice job, but she couldn't remember her login and she just couldn't remember anything. And so she gave up that because it was too embarrassing. So she became a cleaner. And so she was on zero pay contract, no pension, but she really wanted a job. But she was getting a lot of muscle weakness. Joint pain. Joint pain. Mm -hmm. She couldn't use a broom or a, and, a, and so she gave up work completely. She was diagnosed with fibromyalgia for 10 years. And it was only she'd watched something that I was in, I don't know, on Lorraine or something, and decided to come to the clinic. And her mother had bought her the consultation as a present and in three months i just gave a bog standard nhs type hrt after three months she said to me louise i don't think i've ever had fibromyalgia i cannot tell you how i feel the lights come on my brain is working i'm sleeping my muscle joint pains have just mounted and you know she said i've got a cupboard full of antidepressants i've um been back and forth to the doctors at least once a month and i've just been told there's nothing wrong with you and it won't be related to your hormones because that causes flushes and sweats so and the, and this is the other thing like you know it, it is alarming how many how many health specialists don't know what the symptoms of menopause yeah. are that it is a lot more this 
dozens of them and it's not just hot flush hot flushes and sweats no it's not and so certainly actually i've got a card here look you recognize this to me. balance the balance, the balance app. App. i talk about it non -stop. Actually, you know, we've been shortlisted for an award i know so I, I i'm retweeting it regularly yeah so the closing is tomorrow the final call. oh but we're up against headspace which is a very big it's big part. But, but you know we we're new to the block but isn't it lovely and it's all it's all thanks to the team behind it all who are working so hard because it's already been downloaded in women of more than 150 countries across the world and we've had no marketing budget at all but it's free and it that the bit that's free is always going to be free we'll add and to it's, it but... and it's got a big long list on there of symptoms a massive list of symptoms yeah and it and it what's really important is people can monitor their symptoms but what's really good about this as well is that you can create a health report so it will pull together your symptoms and your periods if you're having periods and that is how you should start your consultation with your healthcare professional so you can so print it out and take it in out, there take it to your doctor and say or, or your nurse or whoever you're seeing and say look i've done all these symptoms i've read information I think I'm perimenopausal or menopausal and I would like to take HRT. And so many really people a... say that they they then get sent off for a blood test. But if you're having periods, no, they're pointless. No, they really aren't needed. And um, if a woman is over 45, you shouldn't have blood to hormone blood tests. Even if you're younger, to be honest, I don't do them very often because they can be so unreliable. Um, so if they're abnormal, yes, that can help. If they're normal, it's still I'm going to listen to the woman. So in medicine, I've always been taught and I always practice, I'm not going to do a test unless it changes what I do clinically. Um, and also it delays, you know, if you've come to see me as a doctor and I say, oh, Davina, go have blood tests, I'll see you in three months time. You've got three more months of suffering. This is exactly what I hear all the time. Oh, I'm doing a blood test. I'm going back for the results in two weeks. But in those two weeks, you know, your kids will be put through misery. Like my, I'll have lost my keys 17 times. My phone's in the bin. Like I, I can't, you know, I can't do anything. No, and so often I will say to people, I have no idea how many of your symptoms are related. You know, um, I don't know if they've got muscle joint pains. Is, have they got an arthritis? Have they got something else? Um, if they've got migraines or headaches, is there something else going on in their brain? I obviously don't know. But what I do know is that their periods have changed or stopped. They're getting some symptoms. So I'm going to give them HRT anyway. Anyway. And then I'll review them. If I'm really worried, I will refer them for these tests anyway, but I will still start them on HRT because we know there are so many other benefits and we know the earlier women take it, the better as well. Um, but there are different types, there are different doses. So a lot of people say, oh, HRT doesn't work for me. It's because they're not on the right type. And often they're on, like you said, the synthetic estrogens. Can you be intolerant or allergic to HRT? No, not really. So some people find there is a thing called histamine intolerance where some people find that they get a reaction to the estrogen. Um, but there are ways of minimizing it and looking at your diet. So no one's allergic because who's allergic to their own hormones, really? It's more the sort of changes. So, for example, some people find migraines can get a lot worse during the perimenopause. And imagine the perimenopause, your hormones don't go down nicely. They go all over the place. <laughs> So you can, when they, you get really big high and then a really big low, your body's going, oh my goodness, what's going on? And that can trigger sort of symptoms. And so people think, oh, I can't tolerate hormones. But if you're on HRT, you're, you're sort of flatlining. You're having the same amount all the time. So nice. No drama. Yeah. Yeah. No drama. And you know what? I said earlier, I feel better than, you know, I feel so much better. But it's not even that I feel so much better because lots of people say, oh, am I too young? Am I too young? You know, um, menopause can happen to you anytime. Perimenopause can happen ages before your menopausal. Absolutely. And I was 44 when I noticed, but I'm pretty sure it started a little bit before. Well, I think it often does, and we, we don't always realise. So, I mean, I had my third child when I was 40, and, you know, I've always just then felt a bit tired a bit uh, and i thought oh i've got three children it's mm. life and everything else and and sleep is just a bit disrupted but I thought oh well it's because i'm used to being woken in the night by a baby but actually i look back and think no i'm sure i was low in testosterone as well as estrogen and i didn't mm. think about it at all so. and so many women i mean i think it was something like 66 percent um, when they go to see the doctor and they're feeling a bit low and their mood is down and I think they get prescribed antidepressants. Yeah. 
So this is really important because antidepressants, there's no evidence that they help with the low mood associated with the perimenopause or menopause. There are some women, for example, who've had breast cancer who might not want to rush into HRT. They might help the hot sweats and flushes, but they won't help the low mood. If someone we think has got clinical depression, then of course we'd give them antidepressants. But if they're menopausal or perimenopausal, we'll give them HRT as well. And there is some evidence actually that if you've got estrogen on board, your antidepressant will work better. <laughs> so it's not like one or the other, but you wouldn't just give antidepressants for menopause or perimenopause. And, so and also it would be it. even more depressing if your antidepressants weren't working. I mean, yeah, it would make you feel women. even lower. Yeah, and a lot of women say, oh, it didn't help, or it just numbed my symptoms. One of my patients said to me, oh, I crashed my car the other day, and I just went, oh, never mind. She said, but that's the antidepressants. I don't care about anything, but that's quite a scary place to be. Mm. Um, but she's, a lot of women are told, well, that's all you can have. Well, it's mm. not, and this is where we just have to keep pushing back and saying the evidence, the nice guidance. Mm. You know, the nice guidance are available on the web, on any web, on their website, on my website. Mm. And, you know, I think it's, you know, we really want to help doctors get education. And as you know, I've got a not-for-profit company with doing research and education. We've got an education program through that not-for-profit. So people can really get educated in a very simple way. It's online, so they can do it at home. They don't have to take time off work to go to a course. Um, and that's really helping people, actually, just to be able to get that confidence. Because it is confidence when it's something totally. you're not sure about. Totally. I wanted to quickly ask you um, uh, to kind of go back to um, page one. Um, so you you got your symptoms and you go to the doctor and the doctor says no. <laughs> what do you do? Because I get asked this a lot and I, can, I kind of go, well, go back again and go back again. But it's so demoralising. So what I would do is before that first appointment, so go back before you've opened your book for chapter one, Download the app, the Balance app, read as much information as possible. Everything on there is evidence-based. Download the, the health report and print it off. So when you go to your appointment, because it's only 10 minutes, so every second counts in that appointment, you go and you say, I've made the diagnosis myself. I'm 99% sure I'm perimenopausal or menopausal. This is my health report with my symptoms on it. Now, I have read about HRT and this is what I want. And if the doctor says no, it's really hard because I get scared of going to see doctors and I think, oh, everything they say is going to be right. I would then challenge that decision and say, is there a reason why you're refusing? Um, and if they say, oh, you have to try antidepressants, you have to they say, no, actually, I've read the NICE guidance and I know that there are benefits of me taking HRT and I'm prepared to take any risks. They're very small. If you won't give it to me now, when can I come back and when can I get it and who can I see? And it shouldn't be that people are referred to a menopause clinic um, unless they're complicated. Even women who've had a family history of breast cancer can still take, safely take HRT. Most other types of cancers and estrogen receptor negative cancers still safely take HRT. So for most I, of them, they have to just, and I would even have a friend, I know a lot of it's now Zoom, but have a friend sitting next to you who can help. Yes. And, and just sort of butter Yes, <laughs> yes, back up. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I've, I've talked about this before, um, and um, because of the health benefits that I've heard about, there are many women that say, oh, I just breezed through it. But is it, is it possible that it would be healthy for a woman who has had no symptoms um say at 50 to go on hrt for the benefits you can answer that question can't you yes it is yeah. true i yeah, think I think, I think you know if you look i'm not just being flippant and saying give hrt to everyone i'm doing it based on evidence now if you just look for heart disease which we mentioned at the beginning if you look at the evidence for reducing the risk of a heart attack in someone who's fit and well, we call that primary prevention. So you're preventing something happening. If you give HRT, it will reduce your risk of getting a heart attack by about 50%, reduce your risk of dying from heart disease by about 70%. If you compare that, I know it's a lot. If you compare that with a statin, lots of people take statins or a blood pressure lowering drug, 
then that reduction is not as good as with taking HRT. So just for heart disease, which kills a lot of women... HRT is the best treatment. The other thing is it can prevent or reduce the risk of dementia. Now, dementia and heart disease are the top two killers in women. So actually, just for that, so if I stop my HRT now, I might not get symptoms because I might have gone through my five years of symptoms or however long they were going to be. But the day I stop taking HRT, that's the day where I'll get this build up on the lining of my arteries, I'll get this accelerated bone loss, my brain will start to go because it won't be fed the right hormone, you know, and so it's the health risks that we're thinking of. So these women who say, well, my symptoms aren't too bad, or I'll just wait until they're bad, it's not about symptoms, you know, if you had your underactive thyroid gland, if your symptoms were bad or not bad, you would still take thyroxin because it's an important hormone for cell processes. And we have to think of the hormones, especially estrogen, it's so important. Every single cell in our body has a receptor that responds to estrogen. And now with COVID, we know women oh, it's amazing. with HRT are about 80% less likely to die from COVID. So even if we want it to protect our immune system, then that's fine. Or our heart, or our bone, or our brain. or You know, so, so it's, I think it's actually regardless of symptoms women should consider. And so what we should be doing as healthcare professionals is saying, why isn't this... 50 year old lady taking HRT. Yes, why isn't she? Not, oh my God, it's dangerous. I don't want to put you on it because it's dangerous. And I hear that all the time that doctors are saying, I can't put you on it, it's too risky. But in fact, why aren't we putting you on it? Um, is there a good reason why you can't go on HRT? That is, that it, it's reframing. Like we literally have to get everybody. It absolutely is. And you know, we need to rebrand the menopause. We need to think of it as a, a female hormone deficiency with health risks and then when you talk about deficiency it's like well where is it how can i get it back and we need to not blame ourselves as well for feeling bad for having symptoms and taking hrt is not a failure actually it's a disease preventative treatment and that's what's really pivotal i think about some of the work we're trying to do with the charity and the education is let's just change the whole narrative about what the menopause means to us and our future health um because i think that's the only way we can convince people about how safe hrt is and and actually for the men and the cynics let's look at the health economy and let's look at the global economy of women not working as well and actually the drain the the financial drain of us all being cooped up with dementia and osteoporosis in nursing homes it doesn't even bear thinking about Mm. you and me louise when we're old ladies we can start a commune i know we we can all be like super duper fun live in a sort of commune and all be like super duper i don't want to be cooped up no i don't want to be cooped up either my daughter a while ago would you come and visit me if i had dementia she said well no because you won't remember what's the point (laughs) mean we want we want to keep active and i think you know there's so much more to life and i also think um ending on a sad note really but every day could be our last yes And so we don't want to be worrying, worrying, worrying about the future that might not happen to us. We need to, so if we start looking at benefits and actually taking HRT can enable us to have a better lifestyle as well. You know, and you be exercising like you are. Without there, are a few, there are a few people that have been sending messages. I've, I've dipped in and out a little bit here. That um, there's a few things I want to say that um, the transdermal HRT carries no risk of blood clots. Yeah. Um, so a few people have said, oh, I've had DVT, I can't have it. Transdermal has no risk of blood clots. Secondly, quite a few people have talked about, I can't take it because my family has a history of breast cancer. If you've joined late, Louise is going to save this and put it on yeah, her page. Well, put it out, but you can, still have, um, you can still have HRT, even if you've had a personal clot. And if you've had a strong, even a strong family history, or if you've had a BRCA gene, or if you've had your ovaries removed because of BRCA gene, you can still have HRT. So please, please, I hope, you know, I love you, Louise. And I, I oh, you're very this. kind, but I'm I love sure. what you're doing. I love you too, but obviously, but I love what you're doing. And so just before we go, I think we've got about a minute, just to say, Channel 4, Channel 4, Wednesday, May the 12th, the 12th 9, o'clock. 9 o'clock, 
and I get uh, get everybody to watch it. Get your, your in the get your men folk, it. get your uncles and your granddads and your brothers and your friends and your boyfriends and your partners. Get everybody to watch it because um, everybody should know more about uh, this thing that happens to every yeah. single yeah. woman in the world. Watch it. Download the app, Balance, and go onto the Menopause Charity website next Wednesday. And Brilliant. Let's work together on this. Yes.